In the next couple of sessions, <coughs> I can promise you some more weirdness. Um, I've been making an analogy between quantum mechanical spin and the internal spinning of an object. For, for example, by analogy, uh, if you take the Earth um, moving around the Sun, that's, a, that's orbital angular momentum. But the Earth is also spinning around its own axis like this and that's the analogy that I've been using for quantum mechanical spin. <coughs> but it's only an analogy and analogies often uh, are faulty. Right? Uh, there may be properties in the thing that you're making the analogy to that are not appropriate to, the, to your original thing. That, trying to find an analogy for. And that will become clear in the next, uh, in the next couple of sessions. Uh, there is something truly weird, and by weird I mean counterintuitive, uh, classically unimaginable, or just weird. <laughs> and you'll, you'll, you'll see that coming in the next few sessions. Uh, on, on this board, a board uh, consists of four sessions, uh, two squares per session, eight squares, a board. It's a large board, as you, as you know. Right? Well, uh, as a lead-in to the weirdness, um, in, in the special case of uh, spin, quantum mechanical spin, if you, let's say, uh, let's say your z-axis is just vertical, and uh, your, your z-axis is usually just defined by the orientation of your measuring instrument. Uh, typically, you'll have like a, a strong magnetic field, uh, say like a north pole here of the magnet and a south pole here. And so your magnetic, magnetic field lines are sort of vertical, if you like. And that, that would define your z-axis. So imagine you're shooting particles through, and depending on their spin, they'll deflect up or down or whatever. You know, uh, and then imagine uh, you block the ups, and then you just, well, let's say you block the downs, uh, the, the particles that flect, deflect down, because they can only take uh, two states, right? The spin, uh, spin half, h bar over two. And uh, say so you block the lower ones, and you let the upper ones go through, and then you use those as uh, the initial state to measure another, uh, the components of the angular momentum along a different uh, z-axis. Instead, instead of it being vertical, now let's say it's like that, where, where, where this, this angle here from the vertical is now theta, let's say. And uh, no matter what, what's interesting, and we'll, we'll show it uh, in this session and the next, no matter what that angle is, that angle theta, you will still get uh, the two uh, eigenvalues of uh, spin up and spin down. Uh, you'll still get those two components, irrespective of the angle, which is interesting. And uh, it comes out of the mathematics, you, you get um, that angle theta. In the mathematics, you'll get a term theta over two, so half of theta. And it's, I'm giving you a hint now, it's that theta over two factor term in the mathematics that uh, generates the weirdness. <laughs> So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping I'm just wetting your appetite for, for what's to come. It'll be a, it'll still be a few sessions, but uh, this, this is the lead-in. Okay. So uh, so summarising a little bit um, with that second measurement that where your uh, z-axis now we call it z dashed you know, z dashed uh, its its orientation is at uh, angle theta. So this well yeah, this this angle here is theta. Uh, irrespective of theta, uh, you'll still get the, the same two eigenvalues of plus or minus h bar over 2. You get the same two eigenvalues as you got with that case. And it doesn't matter what the angle is. Okay? So, so keep that in mind. All right, that, that's, that's what's being, being said here. See? So, uh, so if you measure uh, the component of the spin, S, Along the z dashed axis, so that would that would be like that one. Maybe uh, if you start off um, 
uh, where the initial state, you know, go, going into your second apparatus, your, your second measurement. Uh, so let's say this is the result of um, this this uh, up up state is the result of your first measurement. So the first measurement, uh, let's say uh, the z axis is vertical and uh, the your particles you shoot them through the magnetic field and, and, and some will deflect down some will go up so block the down ones so and and so you're using now only the upper ones the, the particles that uh, had eigenvalue up um, so they become the initial uh, state so yeah the up up state uh, for the second um, measurement experiment where you're trying to find you're measuring what is the component of the angular momentum along the z dashed z dashed uh, axis which is this one uh, which is at th degree uh, an orientation uh, theta degrees uh, compared to the original z the vertical all right all right now uh, think think Classically now, think classical mechanics, and in terms of your um, the uh, angular momentum in classical mechanics. So we want a formula for uh, the, the the z dashed you know, this this one, the z dashed component of the spin, in terms of the components. Uh, for, for your original measurement, when, when uh, z, the z-axis was vertical, let's say. Okay. Now, in classical terms, it's this. Now, I had I had to really scratch my head for a while, and um, so the next square, I'll actually derive this because it was it was non-trivial. Now, maybe you can find a smarter way uh, to derive this, um, but I, you know, it it was it, unless unless I took the wrong path, it was a lot more challenging than, than I thought, so I had to give it some thought, and I thought eventually, well, if, if I'm having difficulty, maybe you, know, you, you also will have difficulty with it. So I, didn't, I did not want to just throw this at you, so I thought I'd better derive it, uh, because it's a critical assumption in uh, the next few sessions, and especially the weirdness. So I thought uh, I'd better actually you know, do the details of it, which I'll do in the next uh, square next half of this session right so yeah so c next square for derivation okay now so i'll i'll derive this classically right, using classical mechanics assumptions and then basically what we do is uh, we use we use the correspondence principle remember um now we, we keep using it <laughs> we don't, don't have much choice actually when you're trying to uh, get quantum mechanical results you have to start your analysis. Right? So where do you start? How do you start? Well, one way is to uh, be guided by um, ideas from uh, classical uh, mechanics, you know, class classical physics, and assume that uh, in, in uh, appropriate limits, uh, quantum systems uh, obey the laws, the behaviors of classical. So uh, what happens in classical physics can be a kind of guide, if you like, uh, at least a, a hint giver for uh, quantum behavior. So, so we'll we'll do that here. So we'll assume that uh, this classical relation here is more or less valid for quantum mechanics as well, with one difference: that uh, these physical quantities, uh, measurable quantities um, in classical mechanics, become operators in quantum mechanics. So the, these, this, these three uh, quantities. So this, this would be the component of uh, the intrinsic spin. Let's say, I'm thinking classically, uh, along the x-axis. This would be the component of the, that same spin along the z-axis, and this is the component of a spin, the same spin, the same s, thinking classically, along the z dashed axis, and the relation between. Uh, this S uh, along the, the Z dashed axis is this, right? And then we use the correspondence principle and then we, we change this a little in, in making these now operators. So we put a hat over these three terms. 
And now that we know what the uh, two by two matrix uh, operator is for SX, we have a formula for that, we've done that in earlier sessions. We know uh, similarly for S, the Z component, SZ hat, uh, we know its uh, two by two matrix as well. So we can plug those two matrices in here and here and get, an, and get the matrix co that corresponds to this operator, S, Z dashed hat. Okay, follow, follow that logic? All right, so, uh, so what, I'll, what I'll do now is actually derive this. Where does this come from? Because it's critical uh, for all, all, all that follows, and especially this uh, theta over two uh, weirdness that um, I, I, hope, I hope I've wet, wetted, wetted your appetite with. Right? So, uh, <coughs> here's, here's the derivation. Okay, so think, uh, forget, forget about quantum mechanics for the moment, just think classically, okay? So, uh, this OS is a vector, right? And I've got a, drawn it as an arrow, so just think of, uh, as a, of it as an ordinary uh, classical vector with a, a direction, you know, as this direction and a size, so just think of it as an arrow of a certain direction and a certain size. Yeah. Typical physical physicist type thinking of what a vector is, right? R rather than a vector as in a vector space, uh, which is what the mathematicians think of, of as a vector as. A, f a physicist's vector is just a special case of the more general case of the mathematician's vector, right? Okay. This is a physicist's vector, okay? So o OS, that is the uh, intrinsic spin of your particle, let's say, okay? So OS, all right? Uh, now, here's your z-axis, here's your x-axis. Uh, let's say they're, they're the two axes for your first measurement, let's say, all right? And then you rotate the z-axis to z-dashed here now, and this angle here is theta, all right? So what we're trying to find is the, the component of, of this spin vector right, along the z dashed axis. In other words, it will be O, R. See that? These, li these little squares here indicate a, a right angle, you know, 90 degrees. Right? They're, they're perpendicular. It's like this line is perpendicular to that one. This line is perpendicular to that one.